So let's start with some questions. We did a little bit of uh, research, which is now called stalking. On... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mike, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. This is happy to be here. Yeah, this is great. Leon said uh, off camera, this is such a treat. We really uh, were looking forward to this interview. And you are one of the authors of uh, Forge of, uh, of Foes. Mm -hmm. And we will talk about Force of Foes uh, in sure. a moment. You also wrote uh, The Lazy Dungeon Master, Return of the Lazy DM, Fantastic Locations, Fantastic Adventures, running Epic Tire Games back in the olden yeah. days of 4E. Yeah. And you did a lot of uh, freelance uh, writing. I saw some adventures of you, for example, I think in Arcadia Magazine, if I'm not yep. mistaken. Mm -hmm. I have two and, articles in Arcadia. Yeah. Yes. But. Back in the day, in 2002, in yeah. your personal blog, uh -oh. you, you wrote, and I quote, and you must be <laughs> excited to hear you. What did, what did I say? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> you uh -oh. wrote, Look and, I, and I quote, <laughs> I don't have any illusions about any future career or even making a dime for a written word of mine. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the subject of writing is one that always interests me interests yeah. me sorry yeah. yeah so we come a long way since then yeah what happened I'm, I'm lucky i made a dime <laughs> you made a dime <laughs> yeah yes. it turns out it was there and i, I managed <laughs> to get a dime for it was there all along so yeah. so uh, well, why um, did you think that way back in the day before you started with slight flourish uh, how was the or Tell us a little bit about the the mic of, of that day. Sure. Um, so I, I've God, I think since high school, since like the middle of high school, writing kind of turned from something that I had to do because I had teachers telling me to do it to, to something that I actually enjoyed doing where, where writing was there. And my, my father was a professional writer. He wrote, you know, a number of novels. And so I was living around an author who spent his days writing. And even for him, like he would write during the day for the novels that that he wrote and then at night he would write zines and back then this is in the 80s you know 80 yeah this is the 1980s a zine he would he would write out on a computer we had an apple II computer and he would type it out on an apple II computer he would print it out on a letter quality printer which i think cost like 1100 dollars back then which i think is like 1.2 million dollars now i'm not quite sure what the you know it was a lot it was a very expensive printer and its thing was that it could print letter quality type so it wasn't like dot matrix print it was nice letter quality print and he would take it and then he'd take an exacto knife and he would cut the pieces of the printout and put it on and paste it onto a piece of paper with art that he would either draw or find somewhere and then he would take it all down to the local library and xerox it and make physical magazines out of this stuff and then physically mail it to people like uh, you know like 110 people and he would they would have to send him you know money for the postage and he would mail it out and that was like blogging right that was what blogging was back in the 80s right and i remember like he just loved doing that like that was his shtick was he would write novels like normal and then would also be writing in the evening right he would write other things and so I was kind of around that my whole my whole life. And then I when I went to college and everything like that, I started writing pretty regularly. I would write whatever topic I was interested in, whether it was, you know, back then it was like Doom, like the video game Doom was just, you know, kind of big. So I wrote about that and video game stuff. Then I got into like home theater stuff in a big way and wrote about that. I got into fountain pens and wrote like articles about fountain pens, like whatever I was into. And then I, I started writing for a massive online game called EverQuest. And I played EverQuest for five years, I think, longer, maybe a little longer than five years, and played a ton of it. Played 9,900 hours of EverQuest um, and met my wife in EverQuest. So it was a worthy, it was worthy, it was time well spent. And uh, wrote about EverQuest then too, both on my personal blog. I wrote a lot of fan fiction for it and then got kind of, you know, kind of hired. I don't think I got any money for it. But I got brought on as a writer for a website called Mob Hunter, which talked, which is like a long time publication that talked about EverQuest. And the guy who ran it at the time ended up getting hired by Sony. And he's like, I can't write for this anymore. How would you like to write? And I'm like, absolutely, I'd love to write for it. So that at that point, like pacing of writing was something that was very common to me. I just wrote all the time. And it, it never, you know, never, and this is like late 90s, early 2000s that I was, I was doing this guy. I mean, he said he found an article from 2002. So I've been writing this stuff for a long time. 
<laughs> and and that pacing was something that was just common to me. Writing an article a week was was sort of a pacing that I got used to. Then after kind of EverQuest, I got a little bit of World of Warcraft, but then got back into D and D again. And this was in I think 2000. Oh, I don't remember. It was when right at the edge of third edition and fourth edition, right before fourth edition came out. And I went to a convention where they were showing fourth edition, and I had my first phone that had a camera on it. And I was like, I'm going to take pictures of the character sheets and stuff. And nobody was really doing that. So like wizards didn't really say like, you can't take pictures with your camera phone because who the hell even had one? But I did. <laughs> and I and I posted them to a Tumblr blog that I set up. And that went out to like RPG.net, which was like the big website that everybody went to. And they were passing around and like I'm like, wow, people actually care about stuff that I'm writing here. Maybe I'll make my own blog based on this. And I've already I've been playing D&D for, you know, 20, how long by then? At least 10, 15, 10, 15 years, 15 years, probably at that point. Um, so I had already been playing D&D a whole lot and I, and I've already writing was kind of wired into me already. So I'm like, I want to do a blog about this. Right. And Twitter also just started off and it was like, what if I did a daily DM tip on Twitter? You know, and my wife was like, I don't think you're going to have that many tips in you. And I'm like, well, let me see. I'll just start doing it. And if I can't come up with any more tips, I'll go. And it was like thousands of tips later. Right. I, I can't I haven't counted how many tips I've got. I got a DMD, so. But, you know, a lot more than easily more than that. I think it's 4,000. I don't know. It was a lot of tips. And um, so I really enjoyed, uh, uh, you know, kind of writing. And then and that started Sly Flourish, which, you know, the name was because the domain name was available. And I was just picking through powers from fourth edition D&D. &D, and that one was like, hey, there's a domain. So um, so that that cycle was always you know, kind of there, that idea of writing an article a week, writing these short kind of articles, you know, I've, I've now, at that point, I had been doing it for like seven or eight years for Mob Hunter for my own website. I've done it for 10 or 12 since the late 90s. Before there were blogs, I was doing it. So yeah, it just it kind of got wired and I, I just kept kept running with it. So that's that's how all that, that's all that happened. Now, the interesting thing you, you brought up is like, you know, and that's, it, that's awesome that I wrote that, you know, I, I don't know if I'll ever make a dime. I kind of made a you know, having having being the son of a professional author, one of the things that I saw as a you know firsthand was the rise and fall of income for professional writers. And you know, in my dad's case, it was definitely traditional writing. He had an agent, he had publishers. He would write a novel, they would market it, they'd pay him in advance, and then he would get royalties based off of the books that were sold. And the royalties were somewhere between seven and fifteen percent, right? So, a soft cover book he'd get seven percent a hardcover book he'd get 15 percent, and that would go against the advance that he got so if they they would look and be like how many do we think we might be able to sell this book how much money will we pay him you know let's say it was twenty five thousand dollars they say we'll give you twenty five thousand dollar advance which you know was our income right it was our household income my wife my, my my mom worked as well so she had a little bit of a steady income coming in uh, but then we'd have like a great summer where he sold a book and it worked went really well and it sold very well and we're going on cruises and we're getting new cars and everything's great. And then, you know, all of a sudden we'd have it and we're like, no, we got to be really tight about money because, you know, th the next book didn't do nearly as well. They paid their advance, but that was it because it's going to take so long for the book to sell back. And if the new one doesn't do as well, he'll be paying that advance off forever. Right. And, and you know, it, it, it's, it could be tight. So. I saw that kind of ebb and flow. And I remember talking. So when I got a, a job in the tech industry, I remember telling like my boss who I, you know, carpooled with all the time. And I was like, I am never going to depend upon writing for my income because I saw what happens when my dad depended on it for his income. And um, that kind of ceased being true maybe two years ago or three years ago where I have lowered my time at my day job. It's still there. And but now, you know, of my of my family's income, more of it is coming from the stuff that I'm doing at Sly Flourish than is coming from our other sources. And that's kind of the first time it took about, you know, I think I think I was talking on a Discord server about it. I'm like, well, it only took 15 years. Right. Well, and, and now, yeah. now I that point. But I still haven't quit and I haven't quit because in, in the United States, healthcare sucks. Yeah. And, you know, there's, you, you know, so it's always like, well, I get good health care through my day job. So I'm going to keep doing the day job in order to keep yeah. the health care. Uh, but but in a sense, I have yeah, yeah, yeah. Long as long answer to your question is, I have now figured out not figured out how to make a dime, but I have now made a dime. <laughs> but I, yeah, you know, yeah. you were uh, sold in in the in some part in some aspects of the business from your early years. So that's something that that 
how how do you say that you carry along the, like in your life <laughs> it yeah. seems like like it did <laughs> and, yeah and yeah also we we besides this you play D and D and RPGs yep. so yep. do you think this whole part of your life you you just told us uh, gave you a different view uh, on tabletop games um, than regular players like me I, I I have zero writing experience <laughs> like yeah uh, it's it's a different path like you could say so yeah I mean I try to keep when I think about the game and I think about running the game for my friends and 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 kind of just playing I, I don't I mean It must, and right, that must have. A, I must be treating it differently than 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 I would otherwise. I don't know because I don't have an alternate ego that yeah, doesn't have that experience, so it's hard to <laughs> test it. But I like to think that no, I'm pretty much doing it the same way I was doing it back when I was 14 and playing the game. Right? I think back on the campaigns I ran when I was 14 or 15 years old, and they were really good. <laughs> like they were fun, and you know, and I hope that the games that I'm running now are good and fun, and they seem to be. The players keep showing up, and and we're all laughing about stories that we had in the past. So I, you know, one one thing, and this is this was conscious. I I don't stream my games, and I don't um, I don't treat the game itself as sort of an avenue of the business. That the game is just the game. The game is me and my friends getting together at a table playing the game. And I and I, there's there was a little bit of of overlap where like I would run campaigns that I planned on writing articles about or planned on shooting videos on and i certainly do that i learn a lot from my games that turns into articles and videos and books and, and, and other things that come into the business but i try to remember that like the the game itself is not the vehicle for me to kind of do businessy stuff that the game is the game that i want to play with my friends and you know things that come from that can lead to it but but you know i've got people that are spending their time and energy coming to the to, coming to the table to play I'm not doing that so that I can find another angle for, um, uh, you know, for, for, for the business itself. Okay. Wow. My pink uh, cat again. I, I, I think I never heard that. I, 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 no? Like, just respecting the game in that way. Uh, that's really nice. But I'm going back again 20 years. Yeah. Uh, so, O2. Uh, you already said that you were writing uh, Dungeon Master tips or, or gaming tips or running game tips. Yeah, I don't uh, think I was doing it back in 22 or 2002. Uh, I was writing a lot of other stuff back in 2002, but I don't think I started doing the tips till when was it? I don't know. I'd have to go look. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you you have one tip that was uh, omit needless words. Yeah, that's not then... my that's not my tip. No, <laughs> that's no. Oh no, that's, you talk uh, about that. That's E.B. White's tip. Yes, yes, <laughs> right? exactly. It's drunk and white. Yeah. Uh, but then, uh, the return of the legacy dungeon master, uh, you you have something similar like prepare only what benefits your game. Right. And 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 you in an interview you said that w that was something that stuck with you. Uh, yeah. Why do you think it's so important? That's a good question. So so uh, you know. I think it helps. There's so many reasons why I think it's a it's a valuable it's a valuable aid. Uh, focusing on something like that reminds you what's important. So it really makes you think about like what what's really going to bring happiness and enjoyment to myself and to the players that are coming to the table. When you when you really strip away, a, you know, if you start from scratch, like if you literally just say like I don't even know what I'm going to have when I'm sitting there with my friends. What do I need? What do I have to have, you know? And then you start to like refine down to like, do I really need this? Do I really need this? Do I really need this? And it helps you focus on the things you know are going to have a big impact on the game itself. And an another another good reason is that you don't lose yourself in the other parts of it, and you don't end up spending a lot of time. And I'm, I violate this all the time. Like I, I have good examples where I violate it all the time. But like, you're not going to spend a lot of time on something that doesn't have a high impact on the game or sacrifice something that would have a high impact on the game for something that doesn't. So like, and, and I'll, I'll bring up an opinionated example and I'm, I'm probably going to, you know, anger, anger some folks when I, when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> If you're spending a lot of time figuring out how to get dynamic lighting to work in your virtual tabletop platform, 
instead of saying like, what are the things that I, what are the hooks that I can put into, into tonight's game that connect to the background of the characters that are going to be there? I think the latter is going to have a bigger impact than the former, right? I think that if you, if you really spend time and energy thinking about looking at the characters, looking at the characters of the players who are going to be there at the game and saying, what interesting thing can I do in this game that's going to connect to that character? Is it, you know, a weapon that they're going to get? Is it a, a, an encounter that's going to work really well for their character? Is it a, a hook into their character's backstory that I can bring forward? Is it a discovery they're going to make that they've been seeking for a while? Like, what is it that I can do for that character and thus bring this a bit of excitement to that player? Like, I think that's such a valuable exercise. And which is why it's, you know, it's the first step of Return to you know, the eight steps. And and I think like we don't do that. Sometimes we're like, no, I'd rather figure out how to get like the connection to work so that when you roll a die, that it cycles through your character sheet and, and you know has like there's so many ways that we can sort of you know use weird tools for our games. And or like what if I had a rain effect and I, I had this like cool rain effect that overlay the, the battle map? Well it's like if it takes you like an hour and a half to get that rain overlay for your like there's probably things you could spend like maybe if you really not you know if you've done everything else already and now you just want to do the rain effect but again like i get that people look at that stuff and like oh but it's so cool i really like it yeah and i, I think i think i put it on like back when i was on twitter i put it on twitter and i was like are you really sure yeah. you need that that dynamic you know that dynamic lighting and a bunch of people like yes <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm yeah, being rhetorical, but it's like, yes, I needed the dynamic that. lighting. So yeah. I, know, I know that people really like the dynamic lighting, but that's, that's when it, when it comes to that, like, you know, prepare what you need and, and nothing else. And that's not a, a Mike Sheaism. Like I have heard that from many experienced DMs. I've heard it from many professional DMs. Like I quote them in the book of like people who really say like, you know, the less I prepare, the better my games go sometimes. Not to zero necessarily, not that zero prep is infinite you know, infinite joy, but like you can, you can get away with a lot that you don't have to do. And, and your game might actually be better for it. That was sort of the hypothesis of, of Return to Lazy Dungeon Master. Actually, I, I was yeah. thinking, sorry for, um... no, no, I, I just wanted to add that. Um, I think even the first quote uh, alongside uh, uh, your name and uh, the editor that I believe it was uh, Scott uh, Gray. Scott Gray, uh, yeah. You also have a quote by Jeremy Crawford that says something yeah, right. very similar to this. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And it's common it's commonly held among a lot of DM. Like uh, it's it's pretty common, you know, like I didn't invent all this stuff. That it was it, it was you know, a, a bunch of DMs who've been doing it for a long time have often come down to, you know, one day I had a friend who, you know, he is I have a friend of mine who uh I was just talking to him the other day about this and he was he's very rigid as a DM I'm not rigid like not bad rigid but he spends a lot of time on prep building really rich encounters really thinking about like the different monsters that are going to be there and how they're going to run and, and a lot of detail in his stuff and he was sharing this anecdote about like the one time he went to a game shop and the DM didn't show up and he's like so I just made stuff up and he goes and they loved it and I was like why are you then why are you arguing about this like you just and he's like because you know it was it, it was this loosey-goosey game where i'm just making up hit points and i'm like that's <laughs> what it is right like you're you're, yeah. you're on it like you learned this and so so yeah it's, it's definitely you know it feels like cheating sometimes <laughs> right and i think that's what people kind of rebel against you know but um yeah and like it's a it's a it's a it's a common experience among a lot of dms uh, actually i am i am kind of collecting these bits the last one that I have similar to this was use use your best idea now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like whatever you're thinking, that's the first thing. That's the first yeah. thing that you said, and yeah. then you, your next best idea and, and like this. Uh, but yes. Yeah. Don't don't hang on to them. Yeah. Exactly. That like you know because you're gonna come up with more, right? That's not your only good idea. No. And so, and, and it's wasted if it doesn't come up. <laughs> like if you had this really great idea and you don't play it out, well, there's a good chance it may never come out. So yeah, whenever you, whenever you have like a really fantastic idea, find out, I mean, you know, to a, to a degree, you don't want it to not make sense because of the context. But I think a lot of times, like, and I know I did this as a kid where I'd think of campaigns and I would think about the end of the campaign. And you're like, you know, that's two years from now. What's happening tomorrow? Like everyone's yeah. going to be at your table tomorrow. What are you going to do that's cool for that moment? Right. And yeah. So, so, you know, it, it's also somewhat of like focusing your mind about trying to come up with the cool stuff that you're going to be able to use soon rather than worry about the cool stuff that might happen two years from now. 
it's it's like sorry if I, like DMing, it's like the path to knowing how to prioritize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, like that, we because, all have to do that. We have to do that in all our lives, right? Like we only have so much yeah. time and it's ticking away. So what are we gonna prioritize on? Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, sharing ideas. You recently released some of your books under a Creative Commons license. Yeah. Uh, we are already, of course, uh, read the news, but uh, what was the, the process, your your thoughts that led you to led you to, to release them under Creative Commons? Why did you do this? Because we are, of course, thankful for this, but uh, what do you think? So that releasing stuff in the Creative Commons is actually another long legacy of mine. Like I've been putting out a lot of material in Creative Commons over the years of other things. I have books of fiction that I wrote that I put out under a Creative Commons license. I have blogs that I kept up where I put all my work that was written for those under a Creative Commons license. So I've been pretty familiar with the Creative Commons license ever since it has come out like in the early 2000s. And um, again, you know, just it kind of fit my my style and my approach and my thoughts i was sort of a very you know very much sort of like information wants to be free kind of guy and um so so doing with dnd it's a little different when you're actually making money on a product and suddenly you think about like mm, maybe i don't want to give this whole thing away but even then i've always kind of thought like well there's certain points where i definitely want to release stuff and what was interesting is i had released dm tips and epic tier games under a creative commons license i think years ago but nobody really knew. <laughs> and so I had just kind of done it. And I was like, I put it out there. And I think I put up a Reddit post that said, hey, I have these two books. Oh, the, I guess the third one was the original Lazy Dungeon Master had not yet been put out under a Creative Commons license. But it's like, it's not even available in my store anymore. Like you can buy it on drive through but it's kind of actually hard to even get it. And part of the reason that I wanted to put out, put out stuff under Creative Commons is to hope, you know, I hope that it will last beyond me, right? And it will last beyond any kind of you know situation where like like um you know robert howard's conan work where it gets bound up and a third cousin owns it for some number of years and you know and then that gets you know picked up by some company who's holding the rights on behalf of the third cousin who doesn't really care and you know i so i did this with like my father's books right my my, my dad's books he i you know as his as his as his heir i i own the rights to them And I think all of them are released under a Creative Commons license as well, because like, I don't have kids. And so, and I'm not looking at like, how do I maximize the dollar of my dad's books? I didn't write them, my dad did. So I'm trying to think about like what the original intention of copyright was, which was 30 years after the death of the author, right? And so my dad died 30 years ago. So I shouldn't hold the rights to those books anymore. They should be out in the public. People should be able to do what they want with them. And, um, So I, so I did that with the Lazy DM, but when I announced that I did it for the Lazy DM, I'm like, oh, I should also mention that I did it for Epic Tier and, you know, running Epic Tier games and, um, uh, and, and DM tips. And people acted like they had never even seen those available yet. And I'm like, well, that's great. Like, good, here they are, right? Here are all these three books. Um, now it's important to note that they are released under a Creative Commons uh, attribution, non-commercial license, because I, you know, because it's the entire book My feeling was I didn't necessarily want somebody to be able to grab the, the text of the entire book, go to Amazon and make an ebook for a dollar and start making money off of them right away. It was like, I want people to be able to download them and copy them and send them to their friends or send them the link or, 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 or make non-commercial works out of them. It wasn't really, my, my, the intention wasn't that they could take the text of the work and find a new way to sell it. And so that's why those three books and my father's books, for example, are not available under a commercial license, which is a pretty limiting license, right? When you say it's only available for non-commercial work, that means any ads, you can't, you can't use any kind of revenue directly to support whatever you creation you're making with it. So that's, you know, that that's a tricky bit. But when I think about having like the entire text of a work, I feel like uh, non-commercial or you know, having a non-commercial license is okay. For, you know, it's my feeling on it. But then when I feel like there are certain ideas that you want to put out there that you think can be used in a commercial work, then you should put out a license that allows that commercial work, which is why the Lazy, D the Lazy GM's resource document is under an attribution license and does allow for commercial work. And that's because it's not the full text of the books. It's not all of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. It's just the eight steps. 
So I don't want people to have to come to me and say, hey, can I use the eight steps in an adventure I'm writing? The answer is probably you could have anyway. Like, I, I don't think I'm necessarily releasing something that they probably could have used regardless. But now they know they have my permission, right? Like now they know they're not going to make me angry if they did. And so they can. And and a lot of like the table. So, so all, you know, the Lazy GM resource document includes material from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, Lazy DM's workbook, and the Lazy DM's Companion. But it doesn't include all of the material from those books. It's just certain sets of material that I looked at and said, I bet this could help like application developers. I bet it could help adventure writers. I bet it could help other campaign, you know, other people building their campaign adventures. I bet yeah. they could take some of this stuff and drop it in. Actually, and, and a commercial product, and that'd be fine. A week or two ago, you in, in your show, you yeah, someone told you, "Hey, I did this room yeah. generator," and I almost cried. Yeah, and I was like, was... I almost cried on the air. Yeah, and, um, and it's because it was so was amazing. Like, this, yeah, this and it, the, 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 I mean, I, I was I was surprised by my own reaction. But part of it was just seeing something that you created that is off on its own now. Do it right. That you're not even involved in, but you're seeing it grow is fantastic. And like. The worst thing would be putting it out there and nobody cares, right? Like you put it out there and everyone's like, yeah, great. Like, I, I don't need it, right? Like, like I wasn't useless. But when somebody grabs it and uses it, builds something with it, and that's something that you didn't build, that's fantastic. A, a guy uh, set up a Git, GitHub repo with different versions of it. So there's like an individual, there's a markdown version that's the whole file. There's a markdown version that's individual chapters. And there's a JSON version that hasn't broken out. And I said like, can I get access to the repo? Because I want to stick up a EPUB version. And he's like, you know, it's your stuff. Of course, I'll give you access. So, and, and then I put up an EPUB version. So now there's a version you can download as an ebook for an ebook platform. And just knowing like, it's great that like, it's on his GitHub repo. It's not even mine, right? It's someone else's GitHub repo now has all of these different versions of it. And that, you know, I don't, you know, forever is a really long time, but hopefully lasts longer than I do, right? I'm hoping that the material is, is useful for decades is my, it's my, my hope. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh changing a little bit the subject so in an interview you you said that back in the final days of 4e yeah people were already thinking okay what's the next step uh, and you talk about the gen con wars that idea that dnd was going to die yeah yet mm -hmm. dnd 5e was successful yeah yeah so much that the current plan is to overhaul the current edition instead of making a new one and mm -hmm. uh, this is a broad question why do you believe it was so successful oh yeah <laughs> yeah so what it is something that really fascinates me because when fourth edition was in sort of its heyday uh, me and a bunch of other gen xers that were sitting around writing about it on our blog there was a there was a you know, handful of us but like it was so small we all knew each other that like you know the, the 12 or 14 major 4e bloggers all would knew each other you know, we, talk about go to parties together and stuff and and the common feeling was like you know well video games are going to eat this eat this this market why would you why bother playing DD if you have these games that are so rich and so thick particularly massive online games at the time were such a big deal and people thought that was the future of gaming and gaming companies thought it was the future of gaming right they thought everything is going to be a world and you'll go and you'll live there whatever the game platform is you're going to go there and you're going to live there and now we're like ah, eh, no zelda's fine like zelda is a standalone <laughs> game We are happy as a standalone game, you know, Elden Ring standalone game you can go play. Um, so we really did think that like the end of D&D was going to, we would still play, right? And Gen Xers who enjoyed D&D would probably still play it. But we, we really didn't have a feeling, and I don't think Wizards did either, had any kind of indication that the next generation of gamers, the, 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 the literally the next generation, would actually be that interested in it because video games were so prevalent at the time. And then 5e came out and yeah I, so why do i think it was popular i think i think it's a combination of a lot of things and anytime i see this is something from like data science nerd stuff where i've delved into lots and lots and lots of big big data -y kind of things there's usually not one reason why something happens there's usually a bunch of reasons why something happens and i think i think there was a combination of there was some disenfranchisement with video games particularly with like pay to play games or microtransaction games, like the, the corporation around video games changed. Uh, like MMOs failed, right? So not failed, but like, you know, I mean, I can't even think of many that are active these days. So clearly the idea that, that massive online games were going to take over really didn't come into fruition too much. So so there's that. There was the people really recognize the value of having a bunch of friends sitting around sharing stories as a as a as gameplay, I think resonated with 
even digital natives, right? As, as they refer to them, like millennials who have grown up with a cell phone in their hand, right? Since they're, that they recognize the value of sitting with their friends and sharing these tales and not necessarily having a machine driving the direction, particularly when the machine is driven by some corporation who has a goal of like keeping you there or whatever. So I think that was a big piece. Then of course, streaming was a major factor where now people could see what it actually looks like to play D&D. And something that I just talked about on my, my show yesterday was that they also, when you're watching a streaming show, you're like 80% there, right? Like it's only you, 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 only you not acting in it is the only difference between a, a game that you're watching and a game that you're actually participating in is you're, you, as a player, you don't actually get to do anything. But I think when you're watching a good streaming game, you can feel as close to that game as you feel when you're playing in a game, except for the fact that your character isn't there. So it's, it's not everything, but it's close enough that it gave people that idea of like what the game is about and watching the story drive and enjoying the players. And I think many people who watch shows like Critical Role and watch shows like, uh, um, you know, listen to shows like Adventure, uh, uh, Adventure, not Adventure Time, Adventure, I don't know, other big streaming shows that they they feel like friends, right? They feel like you're they're your friends, like you're familiar with them and you know them. And that can be a little weird too, right? Being too familiar with them. But you can, you still kind of have this connection with the people that are playing. So I think that resonated a lot and people saw what that did. And then they wanted more of that. They saw like, I know what the game looks like now. I see the fun that they're having. I want to have fun with my own friends at the same time. Then you have uh, um, Stranger Things, which shows what the has a positive view of D&D &D and reminds people what it was like to play back then. There's this huge sort of 80s, my, my you know, I have, I have family who, who felt this way too where 80s nostalgia for millennials who didn't grow up in the 80s, but they like the 80s and they like the stuff from the 80s. And so they look at it and say, I wanted some of that, right? I want some of the stuff that you guys did back in the 80s with D&D. &D. And so early. that, right, you know, I want to watch Back to the Future and, and you know, wear Nikes and, and play D&D &D and, and listen to, you know, pop music, Madonna and, and, and Michael Jackson. So like, you know, I think that the nostalgia or, or kind of the perceived, you know, like the same way I'm listening to music from the 60s, right? That like you can enjoy a generation that you weren't even part of. And I think that brought people over. So I think, and then, and then, okay, you know, and then you also have fifth edition, which I believe is the best version of D&D &D that's ever been out. I think it's a fantastic version of the game. I think it plays very, very well. I think that the, the rule set found a way to make a game easy enough to pick up and learn, but complicated enough that you want to stay there and keep playing. An example, like something they did very smart was subclasses at, at first to third level that by giving you this like, you know, bit of crunchy differentiation in your character that has almost infinite growth where like there's so many possible subclasses that you can choose from, but you get it early enough in the game that you can, you know, you'll play many times. It's like you're not just playing the 12 classes or 13 classes. You're playing like hundreds of different classes and subclasses, which means you could play for years and many people have right we've been playing 10 years uh i think that that version of the game coming out and just a lot of the really smart design things that are part of that game uh have also made it incredibly popular so i think and i don't even think that's all of them i think there's probably other reasons too that i'm not talking about but those those seem to me like the big ones that have made 5e as, as successful as it has and brought it now more people like like the Gen Xers who were going to die, you know, where the game was going to die with them, are now 20% of the, uh, we're the oldest 20% of the demographic of the people who are playing D&D, according to Wizards of the Coast, right? They, according to the polls that they've done, people are like, ah, oh, yeah, the polls are BS, but I don't know. Let me see your poll. So <laughs> I, I trust it. And, you know, and that's really interesting that now we're the, we're the minority of people who are playing the game, which some might, you know, grasp and yell and, you know, you know what the cloud's about i think it's fantastic right i'm totally happy that this thing has, has grown so so yeah that's that's those are my thoughts on that yeah um we are going to jump uh, in time again to uh, a fun time in our hobby early 2023 yeah great time <laughs> yeah amazing right? Why, something happened then i don't know what happened <laughs> so you follow the ocl scandal uh, very closely commenting yeah. on each new development yeah I did. <laughs> every day yeah. every day uh, when we started the ghost release the 5e srd under the creative common license 
you said that D&D was now safe and secure. Sorry for the quote, but... Yep, sure. Yep. Uh, that it was now ours. Yeah. You also made the distinction that you won't be calling Wizard of the Coast a first-party publisher. Right. And the other publishers, third-party publishers, anymore. Right. Where do you think the game is heading now that is ours? That's a good... Well, we yeah, we know some of it. The answer is like we I don't I don't I don't know that any of us are going to make an outstanding prediction about where things are going to be. Predictions are really hard and yeah. quote unquote expert predictions are known to be worse than random. So, <laughs> you know, but I think we can see some interesting directions that they're headed. So, yeah, when when the SRD was under the Creative Commons license, I didn't even you know, we all kind of thought this already with the OGL that it was already kind of ours. We thought it was ours, but then we saw this you know what it was an unthinkable action it was really for me it was completely unthinkable like even while it was going on i was like not believing it and there were people who were telling me you know hey it is happening this is really happening and i was like you're lying like i call them liars <laughs> right i was like it can't happen whoever's telling you this is lying because it can't happen and then they did i was like oh my god and i apologized to the guy who did it i'm like you were totally right and i was totally wrong And it was just incomprehensible to me that they could or would do this. And there's still many people who say they couldn't have, even if they had tried it, they wouldn't have been able to succeed. And I know multiple seven figure companies that said, we're going to, we're going to let them take us to court. Like we're going to keep going and we're going to let them take us to court and we're going to battle it out and, and, and probably prove them wrong. Like we'll, we'll, we'll pay the money, you know? And, and so it would have been interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that didn't happen. But then when they put it on the Creative Commons, well, now like, okay, now, it really, now it's really ours because there's no way they're going to be able to take that back. But I know people who are still like, I don't know, maybe they could try to figure out a way to bring it back. And I'm like, this time I don't think they can because like now you got the Wikipedia Foundation against you, right? Like now every other company that's been using Creative Commons for the last 20 years will sue wizards into the ground if they try to, viol if they try to break the Creative Commons license. Like, you know, OGL was really just a handful of RPG companies and you saw what happened. If they tried to do it with Creative Commons, you know, that's like an atomic bomb going off. Like they would, you know, they probably would lose losses. And there's probably like Fortune 500 companies who would come after them, you know, because they use the Creative Commons license to fund their their commercial work. So, um, yeah, so it was ours. So where is it going to go in the future? I, 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 I think and the way I the way I think about it is that, yeah, 5e is now an independent platform. That 5e is just like Linux, right? I've been I've been comparing it to like Linux. That we now have an underlying game engine that is in the Creative Commons and under a non under a, on a commercial usable license. So all you have to do is reference, you know, three sentences in any book, and you can reference the whole material. And doesn't have any other limitations like the OGL did. The OGL had a bunch of things that they said because you're in this agreement, you cannot do these other things. The Creative Commons license doesn't have that. So we're already seeing two companies that have said we're making our own version right two big companies and that's cobalt press with tales of the valiant and cubicle seven with their c70 20 c70 20 game so that means two other you know big company more you know million dollar a year companies are making their versions of 5e that are you know i mean compete is a strong word but sit alongside whatever wizards does in 2024 um now I don't, I, I certainly don't expect that either of those versions or any of the other existing versions of 5e are going to be able to truly compete with whatever Wizards of the Coast puts out. And like my friend Teo Sabadia wrote about this on Alpha Stream, which is like everybody who talks about the D&D killer is fooling themselves because like, you know, the minute you get Paramount to make your movie, well, now maybe we'll talk to you. Right. But like, you know, even if you look at the number of people who bought and, and play the Avatar role-playing game, which may be the biggest second role-playing game, is probably still not as big as D&D, &D, right? Like it's, I mean, it made $4 million on a Kickstarter. That ain't nothing. But, you know, D&D, &D, they spent $130 million buying D&D &D Beyond. So I think they're at least <laughs> an order of magnitude bigger, you know, than the next biggest one, if, you know, on, on all, all things being equal. So I, I, but I, but I do think that like it, it, it does mean that, you know, we'll prob these probably aren't going to be the only 5e variants we're, we're going to see. I think somebody had, and I, I downloaded, I haven't looked at it yet, but people have already started looking at like 5e variants that are built around the old school style of gaming. So more what I refer to as opinionated RPGs. So an opinionated RPG where somebody 
takes the engine of 5e but says yeah except i don't like this major part so i'm going to focus my version along this narrower line and 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 have this opinionated view of the game and, and not in a bad way but like in a focused way that says our ver and if you think about like five torches deep uh five torches deep is sort of a 5e version that is an opinionated version that says we want to treat it like darkest dungeon where lighting really matters where resource management really matters where it's much more like low power grim style than it is the sort of super heroic nature of of 5e uh, i bet you're going to see a bunch of those because we've already seen a bunch of other old school sort of games that are that are closer to 5e you could almost look at um shadow dark the shadow dark rpg which isn't really 5e right but it, it takes it's you know old school style with modern sensibilities is i think the tagline of that and those modern sensibilities in many cases look a lot like 5e it's got the advantage system it's got the core stat blocks it's got a lot i think i, I can't remember if if shadow dark i think shadow dark references the srd uh through a creative commons license so i think they're they're, they're directly saying hey we're using material from the 5e srd but it's different enough that like it's not really 5e like it's not like you can grab a 5e monster and run it in shadow dark right you'd have to you'd have to convert it so i think we'll probably see more narrower focused rpgs that are built along 5e i bet you we don't see a lot of general ones um i think we're going to see these big ones i think we're going to see tales of the valiant and cubicle 7 you know, c7020 uh we're seeing uh level up 5e which is n world's uh 5e variant uh they're just kind of changing their license um just based on the ogl thing but i don't i don't think like they're not putting out a new version or anything like that but that's a really strong and now has existed for i think more than a year i think it's been a couple years old now uh, another 5e alternative so i i think we're going to see more of that and that's going to be great and i think it's great that we can look at all of the 5e material that any other publisher has produced and use it with any of these variants with with minimal conversion i don't i don't think they're all going to stand completely on their own um, but I think it won't take a ton of work to get, you know, one to work with the other. And, and I think that's really good. And then I think we're going to see a bunch of new RPGs as well. We, we saw, uh, um, Darring Darrington Press just put out, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Ken uh, Candela Obscura, oh, yeah, heart. right? So, and, and then they're going to have Daggerheart, right? So they have these two other RPGs that they're putting out. MCDM, of course, has their opinion. So, and their RPG that's coming out. So we see, we're seeing a lot of new things coming out um that is great you know that's yeah. precisely what what i wanted to ask you um going in a little bit of a more general direction how how would you describe what what you're feeling right now about uh, the industry in general uh, are you excited uh, are you cautious not only about the uh, games that uh, as you just said will be created in the 5e sphere if you'd like but other games other systems because some creators believe that what happened not only changed the uh, the D, &D sphere of influence but also uh, made a, a little bit of an earthquake in the industry in general and um, in some way revived or resuscitated the uh, different ideas or or the need for different kinds of games or, or systems what are your thoughts about the industry in general now uh, after the ogl debacle yeah very i'm very excited and i'm very hopeful like i i and i'm, and I'm po i feel positively about it i think things are really good um and i think they're 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 good for a whole bunch of reasons and i think there's only really one thing that could kind of steer things in a in a negative you know the, the industry in a negative way um but overall i think and and this is not uncommon too i've talked i've, I've talked to other kind of people publishers in this market and publishers in this industry some of which who have been around for you know decades and kind of said like how do you feel about this and they're like you know this ebb there 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 are common ebbs and flows i, I think again that's like it's sort of like the there's never any one thing you can never look at the past and 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 use it as an indicator of what the future is going to do directly but a, a mixture of major changes in you know the world mixed with kind of common trends in history together might give you general ideas about where things are going and so the idea that like um you know they're back in the 4e days people were kind of disenfranchised with 4e 
not, not not because of the OGL thing, right? but, but like they were generally, they they felt like 4E didn't really hit the mark. For a lot of people, it didn't feel like the indie. For a lot of people, it wasn't their style. And then we saw some fantastic RPGs come out of that. Dread, you know, Dungeon World came out of that. And uh, 13th Age came out of that. And a lot of like really, you know, Fate. Fate was like, I got really into Fate around that time. Fate, Fate Core and Fate Accelerated and other ones. And Numenera, well, Numenera is later, right? And some of those other ones are kind of later. But we saw some really interesting RPGs that went in very different directions from like what D&D 4th edition was doing. And I, I, you know, those games are still around and we still love them. We still play them. And I think even in the early 5th edition days, we saw like, you know, we saw people that worked on 5th edition who left Wizards and then went and made their own systems. Like uh, Robert Schwab made Shadow of the Demon Lord and Monty Cook went and made the Cypher system with Numenera. Two very, two very different, different kind of games with different kinds of atmospheres, and and then and then you know Robert, uh, 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 Rob Hainso and Jonathan Tweet made Thirteenth Age. So now you've got you know four different publishers, four different people that used to work for Wizards of the Coast that made four different art, three different RPGs that went in very different directions from uh, uh, where things had gone, and um, I think we're seeing something similar to that now. I don't, I don't, I don't think I've seen people who used to work at wizards that are now making new games although you could say well i mean that's exactly what wolfgang bauer is doing right wolfgang bauer worked at wizards of the coast for many many years and now he's but but you know like he's already been making so much stuff for fifth edition that that tales of the valiant is just almost filling a tiny hole that he's had which he never had a whole system and now he does right like soon soon he will have the whole system um but i i think we're going to see a good mix of new fifth edition core systems lots of fifth edition supplements and then lots of other role-playing games that are filling in these uh niches and holes that D D doesn't scratch whether it's a stronger tactical angle like mcdm that's role-playing game uh whether it's a more narrative story focused game that works well in a streaming setting like candela candela obscura uh, or, or the underlying system for that. I forget what the name of the D6 system that sits underneath there. That, that, um, uh, Illuminated Worlds, I think. Illuminated Worlds, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know why I keep thinking lightning or something, but no, Illuminated Worlds. So the Illuminated Worlds D6 system seems designed as a good platform, both for fun story-focused games, but also one that works well if you're streaming. And a lot of people early on when streaming was getting big was like, are we going to see D&D turn into a streaming game? Where like, it's going to have design principles that work well for streaming. And well, now we're watching a company whose you know poor product is a stream, <laughs> who is also going to be making two RPGs. I bet you those games work pretty well for streaming, right? I think that's going to be one of the requirements. Yeah. So, so we're going to see a lot, of, you know. So I'm very, I'm happy about all that because I love all of this. Um, and 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 then of course next year we're going to have new D and D core books, and I'm pretty positive on those too. A lot of people aren't, but like. I, you know, I think they'll probably be okay. There's, the, and I, I changed day to day. I'm like, oh, you know, one day is like, oh, it's gonna be terrible. And the other day, I'm like, oh, it's gonna be awesome. So probably be somewhere in the middle. But I don't think it's gonna <laughs> fix everything. Like I think we're gonna have all new problems when this comes out. Um, <laughs> you know, like they're they're gonna fix some things, and then there's gonna be things like, hey, you know, now we got this other new problem. <laughs> so, um, but th that's gonna be good. Now the only dark cloud on the horizon for this is if Wizards does drop the ball when it comes to D and D, if they you know, or and it couldn't. It might not even be their fault. But if Wizards just has a hard time bringing new people to the hobby, like they've been bringing people to the new hobby, which is, I would argue, is a good percentage of it is luck over the past ten years, that that will reduce the total number of people that get into the hobby overall and find these other systems and run with these other systems, uh, and and keep the industry solid. But then I always come back to like if there are if there are five people left on the planet and they have a die and and uh, you know a small book they can the role-playing games have still survived right that like unlike any other game any other electronic game that anybody's playing role-playing games can survive anything like the core technology for a role-playing game was invented by the egyptians you know a thousand years before christ was born so like you know we're gonna you know the technology for this can survive <laughs> you know like and that's something I, I think about a lot, which I, I just love the idea that like, it's gonna be really, really, really hard to kill role-playing games without killing it, without killing all of us as well. Yeah. So, you know, that's, we'll, that's, we'll get yeah. role-playing. Yeah. yeah.
So you you talk about uh, next uh, supplements uh, that might be rising <laughs> in these days. So let's talk about Forge of Foes. Sure. That's a, a project you wrote with Theo Samaria and Scott Fitzgerald Gray. Yeah. And this is not your first work together. You no. had also worked in Bolt of the Draco Age. Yeah, and... Five Wizards of the Coast. Yeah, Four Wizards yeah. of the Coast. So I am curious, how did you come to know Theos and Scott? And what what is like to work with them? Sure. Um, okay. So I, I love to tell this story because, you know, I don't know. I don't think it embarrasses them. The first <laughs> time I, I didn't really meet Teos. <laughs> I saw, I witnessed Teos. And it was at a Winter Fantasy game. This is a Winter Fantasy is a yearly convention that takes place. Now it takes place in Indianapolis or in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And it was at this time when it was at Fort Wayne. And I, I, I had, I had read Teos's work like on his blog and stuff like that. And I knew he had been he had written things for Wizards of the Coast. And I, and I, I it was kind of like in, you know, Winter Fantasy is this fantastic small convention with like a couple hundred people. So you really get to see everybody. It's one giant room, so everybody's in one place, which means it's great to like run into people and see people and meet people and everything like that. And I look, and three guys are walking through the door wearing these great big Chewbacca coats, right? And they're all like they're big Wookie coats with like the bandolier across it and fur like waving in the you know, behind him and all three of them are walking in like the front of reservoir dogs like the introduction to reservoir dogs it was like it should have been in slow motion right and the, and they just walked in like they owned the place and i was and i you know i looked and i was like you know damn those guys are cool right <laughs> like i'm never going to be that cool like look at them they just own this place with their chewbacca jackets he told me later that it was like one of his friends who bought them for all of them and he's like they were terrible they were uncomfortable they smelled bad <laughs> but I, you know, so that was the first time I like saw Tails. And then I think we we kind of, again, sort of in that time in the fourth edition where everybody was, right, or not everybody, but a handful of us were writing blogs about 4E. A handful of us were doing freelance work for Wizards of the Coast and kind of met through that. And I think I had met him through that. But then uh, one of the producers of D&D &D, uh, brought myself and Tails and um, Scott together to work on Vault of the Dracolich. And uh, they wanted to do an experiment where instead of having a designer write stuff who then feeds it to a developer who then cleans up a lot of the mechanic -y stuff and then it goes to an editor who fixes it, they said, we want all of you to be working on it at the same time. And they paid us a good rate. They paid us, you know, they paid us a, a, a good wage for the time uh, for us to do it. It was Greg, Greg Bilsland, uh, who was the, the a senior producer of D&D &D at the time. Um, and he was the one who kind of was our, our, our handler for the job. And we were all really excited for it. And it was it was right at the end of fourth edition. So it was like it had to be fourth edition compatible, fifth edition compatible, and I think third edition compatible. Like their their goal was to kind of show that like, you know, D and D is D and D. And so we don't necessarily and we didn't have to do stat blocks for all three versions, thank God. But we needed like an adventure where like there would be multiple ways that you could play. I think I have that right. I think we 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 had that design. And I learned a ton of stuff about designing. So it was a multi table event multi-table uh, uh, product. It was designed that like anywhere from like four to 12 tables could run it. So designing a dungeon where anywhere between four to 12 tables could run it was very interesting. And uh, the other one was like, we want you to face the Dracolich, but you can't be higher than fourth level. And we're like, how are we going to do that? Like, you know, and so I don't remember even how we came up with the answer to that. Um, but we loved working together. And, and you know, I mean, Teos, we had all stayed friends after that. We'd all talked to each other a lot after that. Uh, Scott and Teos uh, worked with another friend of ours, Sean Merwin, and all three of them worked on the Acquisitions Incorporated book. And then, um, and Scott and I have now worked together. He he has uh, uh, a, a, a agreed to uh, edit many of my projects since. And um, he's just outstanding. The partnership between he and I, like, I don't think my books would have been nearly as popular or near, done nearly as well as they have without, without, his, without his keen eye to keep things on track. And just a fantastic dude, fantastic editor, and best editor I've ever worked with. And um, uh, then, we, then Scott and I had finished, uh, we, so we had done a collaboration with James Ritter Casso uh, on a book. Uh, the three of us had done one. And then I did uh, The Lazy DM's Companion. Scott was the editor on that one. And then I said, I'm going to take a year off. Like I'm, I'm tired and I want to take a year off and just sort of 
find out what the baseline looks like again. You know, Lazy DM Companion did very well. In his first time I did offset printing, all this other stuff, but I want to kind of just take it easy. And he's like, how, how about instead we work on another project? And I'm like, oh, sure. I'm like, you know, I'll work with you. So then he and I were kicking ideas about like, well, what do we want to do? And we came up with like 30 different possible products we would work on. But the one that we thought was really good was this monster builder project. This idea of like, what if we had a book that told you how to make monsters or how to build them, but did it in a way that was very fast and very easy and, you know, focused on building and customizing monsters and all that. And we knew that Teos was already working on a project very similar to that, where he was working on this idea called monster powers. So I said, let's talk to Teos and see if we can get his brain in this too. So we brought Teos in, we talked to him about the project. He agreed, you know, he, he thought it sounded really awesome. And then we were had the team back together again, right? The same team that we worked on with Vault of the Dracolich. And uh, yeah, so we worked on it for about a year, I think, kind of kicking around ideas and working on stuff and, and getting everything set. We, we had originally planned to launch the Kickstarter in 2022 in like October, and then decided it would really be better if we did it in, early, in, in like early 2023. And that way we could have more of the book done, better idea of what we were doing and get everything set. And that way we had the rough draft done before the Kickstarter launch. So like we knew what the book was going to be by the time we launched the Kickstarter. We'd already commissioned art. We already had, you know, a bunch of, we already had the internal design. So a lot of the baseline design work was already done before we did the Kickstarter. And then the Kickstarter did great. So, um, yeah. So at this point, the book is in editing. Uh, like we've done all of our revisions. We've done all of our second drafts. We're, we're taking a few pieces and kind of running it by people to say like, hey, does this make sense? Is this, does this, the mechanics of this part work out? Um, and then, uh, yeah, our, our plan is to have the PDF of it available to Kickstarter backers at the end of June. And then we have to go through the cycle of getting it printed. And, and that'll probably be, you know, two or three months after that. And then we'll have to deliver to Kickstarter backers and they'll be on the store. So yeah, fantastic, uh, fantastic experience. Really, really fun. And really a pretty, you know, a pretty transformative book. We have this idea in the book called the quick monster builder which is a table it's in the sample chapters you can you can download this for free and actually we're going to release that under a creative commons license as well once we're done with the book we're going to pick out certain parts and put it under the same creative commons license that allows for commercial work too so that people can use the design ideas from this and products there will be gen automatic automatic generators <laughs> based on that yeah bro, yeah sure. <laughs> yeah yeah can, can i and, ask a, yeah. a little something uh you said that you have a bunch of ideas and then you land on yeah you. somewhere we have that list i'll have to go look and see what oh, see yeah, what yeah. number two I, see what number two was to, i was about to ask you what's number two uh that is yeah slowly. i don't i don't know i should go look <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember i know what i know what my next two projects are going to be so like oh, whatever nice. number two would be would be three years out <laughs> so i don't know i'd have to look but yeah, i've already got i think i'm already slated for what my 2024 project is going to be and then probably what my 2025 project is going to be so yeah i've i've, I've already I, i like you know the idea of one book a year has worked well for me and i and i like doing it and it, it seems it seems to it seems to work out so i think uh I think that's how we're gonna keep going with that. Yeah, I should go look at what number two was. I don't know what it was. <laughs> so It'd be really yeah. fascinating. Is, we are a journalist after all. Is there anything you can say about your uh, future projects? Sure. Uh, yeah. That yeah. Uh, we can share. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Something. Why not? Right. Why? You know. Why not? So um, I think the next project won't won't come as many as a surprise for anybody who's been following my my nonsense, which is I've been working on a, a source book called The City of Arches. That's been a Patreon product now for more than a year. I think it's almost a year and a half. I have to go back and see exactly how long I've been doing it. And the the goal of that one was a slow burning, a slow burning project where like I would do just a little piece of it at a time, release that piece to Patreon, get feedback on it, see if people like it, and then kind of do the next piece. And it's sort of mutated because like I wasn't sure exactly what this thing. I'm not I'm still not even exactly sure what this thing is. But I, it's kind of a source book. It seems to be leaning towards a source book. It was originally going to be a giant campaign adventure that was first to 20th level. And then has turned more into what I, what I think would be more useful, which is a very DM focused, very table usable setting. That's, that's not huge. It's not like an entire world. It's not Midgard. I love Midgard to death, but it's not like, hey, here's this entire empire. It's like, it's really just this location and what's in and around it but designed in a way that that dms can grab whatever piece of it they like or whatever region kind of excites them and run with it so 
Um, so I'm I, I'm in love with it, right? I'm and I'm I'm happy to I'm I'm in love with the fact that I'm in love with it because like I can put myself to sleep at night thinking about a region of it, and the next day like oh I'm gonna do this thing, right? Um, so I'm I'm hoping to have enough of that ready to go by next March that I can launch a Kickstarter for that and then have a nice source book. I don't expect it will be nearly as popular as the other stuff that I do because this kind of work I don't you know people come to my to my little world because they want GM advice. And, you know, there's lots and lots of people have lots of source books. So me putting out another source book, I'm, I'm in a different market where there's lots of stuff that's already there, but it should probably make enough money to pay for itself. And it, and that to me is a success. So if it pays for itself and people like it, um, I'm happy with it. And I've seen that with other projects I did. I did a book called Fantastic Adventures, Ruins of the Grendel Root, which is 10 adventures in an underground setting. Another book that I'm in love with. I look back regularly on it. I, I'm sure it's egotistical as hell to go look at your old stuff and be like, wow, and this is so good. But like, I do, like I look at it and I'm, I'm so happy with it. And now I'm watching more and more people who are playing it and running it or have run it or have built campaigns on it or made it their own. That even though it didn't necessarily blow the doors off as far as, as like a Kickstarter went or even as a profitable product went, seeing people that are using it and playing, that's all I need, right? Like. You know, it made enough to pay for itself and made more than enough to pay for itself. It is a profitable product, but it's not like Return to the Lazy Dungeon Master, right? And and I'm sure this new one, the City of Arches project that I'm working on, probably won't be either. But if I, I want to be able to look at it 20 years from now and be like, man, you know, that was a that was a really fun thing that I did. Um, so that's probably the 2023 project. And then I'm going to, or 2024 project. And then we're all going to see what Wizards does with the Dungeon Master's Guide uh, in 2024. And that will have been five years since return. And it's probably make it worse. What's that? <laughs> they can't make it worse. Yeah, they can't make it worse. I don't know. I think the DMG, I think the 2014 DMG gets a bad rap. I think it's not as bad as everybody said. I, I, you know, I think it turns everybody off the minute you start off with, hey, let, first thing you need to do is set up a Pantheon. And you're like, really? That's the first thing you need to do? How about running a game? What do you think? How about like, you know? So yeah, like the organization is not great, but I, I, I think there's a lot of material in there that's great. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I am, you know, this is gonna, this is kind of a jerk thing to say. I am confident that they will not put out a perfect DMG, uh, you know, a fully where I look at it and go, I've got nothing, right? I've got no way to improve this. Probably that won't happen. Um, I also feel like I, I, this is where I have my chance to make an opinionated Dungeon Master's Guide, right? I can make, and I'm not, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to claim that this thing will be a Dungeon Master's Guide, but like I can make a product that sort of sits alongside the Dungeon Master's Guide that says, yeah, it's saying you can do all of these things. There's also this other way, and there's also these other tricks, and there's also these other tools that you can use to build a different kind of D&D game and a different kind of fifth edition game that goes in a different direction. And my, 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 you know, I have not written word one of this mystical tome yet, but I expect it will take the best of return, the best of the workbook, the rest of the companion, and all of the other things that I've learned over this time, and a look at what other people have been doing and saying in their guides that either work well or that I don't want to put in this, and then make another book, probably a bigger book than, than those, um, that, is sort of the you know the newer return of the lazy dungeon master or something like that i don't know what i don't have a name for it yet and you know but but and and i may and you know of course i i hold full rights to change my mind like we'll see next year how things go but that's that's kind of my thought is next year is going to be awesome or is is city of arches and the year after that is going to be this other new return because i think the timing is right for that at that point yeah speaking of of time <laughs> like we started with that quote of yours i don't like what advice would you give to people that are on the verge of creating content for dnd or another yeah. games people that might think like mike from 20 years ago i don't have any yeah. influence about making a future career of a, a, or even making a dime for a region world of mine Uh, yeah. But the subject of writing is always is one that always interests me, quote unquote. Like yeah, and, and, um, and I would like to add something. Yeah, we are doing this, and we hope that we'll have this translated. <laughs> we yeah, have this great. Gap. So awesome. this is not only for uh, English speaking right. yep. people. Yeah, 
we Great. we hope this gets seen by many people. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's so awesome. We wanted, yeah. we wanted to make it this useful for them. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I always like to offer the quote from uh, the artist John Baldessari. John Baldessari was a, a popular a pop artist in the 60s and 70s. He won the Presidential Medal of the Arts from Obama in in 20 whatever whenever that was 2010 or something like that. And uh, there's a wonderful uh, documentary uh, about John Baldessari on YouTube um, uh, that's done by uh, a guy, I forget the name, a musician that does it, and he's fantastic. And he gives his advice to artists, and he offers three things. And the first one is he's like, uh, you must be obsessed, which you cannot will. Uh, talent is cheap, and um, be at the right place at the right time. And I love those three pieces of advice because they're all things you can't do. Right? They're, they're all things that you, you you can't you know you can't control right like and then that's that's part of it and it, it's and in, in that case it's terrible advice because who wants to hear be at the right place at the right time talent is cheap and you, you have to be possessed which you cannot will but i've seen people who are like i want to be a writer and you're like well that's easy just write but then they're like ah, that, writing is hard I'm like writing is hard writing is hard right like you know that's that's cool right like you don't don't it would be sad if you felt like you want to be a writer but you don't like writing <laughs> so you know that 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 could be a tricky one um so aside from the fact that like you really got to reckon especially when it comes to like success in this in this industry luck plays such a huge factor and it drives people bananas to hear that like no one wants to hear that that you know be lucky right and but it's true. It's sad, but true, right? And so then, then the other one is like, well, then how about change the goalposts, right? Where like, if you, you know, when you talk about like, well, can you be successful in RPGs? You get to define what success means. And so how about changing the definition of success to something where the odds are in your favor rather than something that's going to be the equivalent of winning the lottery? So an example would be, if your definition of success is that you get hired at, by Wizards of the Coast to work on the next version of D&D, you're basically asking to win a lottery ticket, right? I know people who have done it. I, 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 I you know, I've, I've, I have friends who have done it, but I also have a lot of friends and I don't have a lot of friends who have done it, right? And, and I know a lot of friends who are really, really smart and haven't done it. So, you know, how about instead it's, I want to probably, you know, I want to make a dime, right? I want to, I want to put out a product like saying, I want to put out products that at least pay for themselves. That's a reasonable goal. Like that's something you can do. And there's no, there's nobody in the way of that goal. Like there's nobody that's standing in front of you like Wizards of the Coast saying, oh, well, if you want to be hired here, you got to get through hiring managers, right? And maybe they don't like you or maybe, you know, maybe they don't have the position or they don't, you know. So being able to put yourself in a position where nobody else is in your way for whatever your definition of success is, I think is a good a good way to go. Um, I think it's you know defining defining success and if you know, I would never claim like oh you should do what I did right because it's it's an impossible you know stupid path, and I've offered terrible advice. I talked about James Intercasso right, and one of my favorite things is James Intercasso when I didn't know him came to me and said hey I I want to start a podcast and I want to know what you think about that, you know as a guy who's done podcasts before and I was like that's a stupid thing to do don't do podcasts. Like podcasts, you know, they take up too much time. They're too hard to edit. The bandwidth cost is too high. And it takes way too much time to digest the content that's in it. Instead, go write blog articles. They're cheap. They're fast. People can read them quickly. Bandwidth is too low. And I still think like that makes sense. But then he did a podcast for like 10 years that was super successful, right? He did, he did this, he built a whole podcast network. He brought a whole ton of other people who then did podcasts. And it was fantastic. So I'm like, and I told him like every week, I was like, James, I'm so glad you didn't listen to my advice. Like, thank you for not listening. Cause like, there's so much wonderful content that's out there that he did that wouldn't have existed if he had, if he had listened to my stupid advice. So I'm always careful about, you know, like recognize the fact that I'm just one idiot saying these things and recognize that my advice could be terrible. could be really bad advice. Um, speaking of bad advice. So one other thing I would offer is like, I, this is something I've been thinking about more and I've been talking about with some friends which is like, you know, sort of the, there's, you know, there's many different paths that you can take in the RPG industry, but one of them is like publishing your own thing versus trying to do freelance work. And first of all, there's no reason you can't do both. There's no reason not to try both. And I actually have done both and still do both. I, 
I've, I've recently done freelance work for multiple companies and I uh, still publish my own work. And I would lean towards publishing my own work first. If I had to choose between the two, I would publish my own work first because again, you don't have anybody in your way. I don't have to depend in, you know, a lot of good reasons for it, but two, two big ones are no one's in your way. No one is telling you what to do. No one is telling you uh, what you're making isn't really what they want. No one is defining it. And then the other piece is if you do happen to make a dime, you might make another dime later on that same product. And you might make another dime later on that same product. You might make a dime every month on that product. But when you do freelance work, you almost certainly only get paid once and then that's it. And it doesn't matter how popular the thing is you made, you're only getting paid that one flat fee, right? Like, you know, Scott and Teos and I got paid very well to do Vault of the Dracolich. It has sold many copies since and we're not seeing any of that money, which is fine, right? Like we agreed on that, it's Windsor's property. They don't owe us anything. Um, you know, but when you can get on, when you can, when you can put out a product that, that lets you bring in royalties from a business standpoint, I think royalties are way better. The example I bring up is like, again, because it's all, you know, because luck plays such a big factor in all of this stuff that, um, if you're, you're already going to get lucky to get a freelance job and you might get lucky if you can publish your own material that people actually like and want to buy. But if you look at the top end caps for those. I doubt you'd see anything like what Kelsey made on Shadow Dark RPG. She made a million and a half dollars, right? What what freelancer is making, you know, I mean, in, in her case, let's let's pretend for a minute that she sees half of that amount of money, which is probably, you know, I don't know what the business is behind it, but I've been in the publishing business and a good rule of thumb is you're making half of whatever the gross is, right? Hopefully you're making half of what the gross is. That's $750,000 right for her first kickstarter i don't know anybody in the freelance world who makes seven hundred fifty thousand dollars a year <laughs> or or, or seven hundred fifty thousand dollars over 10 years <laughs> right I mean, it's very very rare so the top end for publishing your own work i think is way higher than the top end is for freelance work and i think like a lot of the discussions that we see online about freelancer pay rates and freelancer you know royalties royalty splits and um, other, other, um, you know, other discussions about it. You can see there's a lot of angst there when it comes to freelancing. Um, and, and it's a good question if you're an independent producer on deciding is the value of freelancing worth it? Like for me, it was like, look, when Cobalt Press said, Hey, we'd like to, you know, we'd love to have you work on Tales of the Valiant. I'm like, sure. A, you're going to pay me. And Cobalt Press, uh, has, has compensated me well. And B, I get my name in the book. And that's marketing. So I get a little free piece of marketing in that book. And I can say on this show, like I'm one of the designers of Tales of the Valiant, right? And, you know, that's a benefit that I get on top of the fact that I did it. And, and you know, the work wasn't, you know, a year, right? It was a relatively small assignment. So that's great, right? And that works really well. So I would, you know, leading back to the web advice, think heavily about producing your own work, <laughs> right? Because I would lean towards trying to make it success building your own thing more than I would say trying to get in someone else's door uh, would be something. So I'll stop with those pieces. I could go on forever, obviously. Thanks a lot. Well, <laughs> it's a great piece of advice. It, it was really we'll see. I don't concrete. know. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> it we seems see. so. It's like, <laughs> like predictions. Seems like good advice. Sounds, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know. yeah. We, we'll check it. If it works, we, we'll say sure. you said it here. Yeah, perfect. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> we'll use it up to advertise the show too. So, yeah. Mike, uh, thanks. Many thanks uh, from us. We really enjoyed this interview. I think we learned a lot. Uh, awesome. It's uh, really a treat, like Leon always says in, in our interviews. Uh, and we hope to hear more from you. And we will have him a friend of yours. Yeah, okay. I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to we're going to save the, the name. Sure. All right. I'll, I'll keep it to myself. With a little bit of suspense for yeah. our audience in the future. But awesome. uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And thank, thank you. you. That's a real treat for me too. I've really enjoyed this. Thank, thank you. you.